Um, thanks, uh, Fong, for doing an excellent job of the lab. Um, that was the first time he's done that, so uh, I think he did a very good job and uh, excellent. Okay, so, so now we're switching gears um, to, instead of looking at macro scale type events in the genome, looking at the very highest resolution events, um, somatic mutations. Um, so I wanted to start, though, uh, with just thinking about cancer and how it progresses and, and putting into context um, cancers into e evolution. And, and that this will become clear uh, over the course of the, the lecture why this is important. Um, so the clonal evolution theory of tumor cell populations was first proposed in 1976, so um, quite, quite some time ago. Um, and, and really uh, casts cancer into um, the rubric of, of phylogenetics or, or evolutionary theory. And the theory really predicts several features of, of cancers, and one is that tumors will change over time. And so if we think about the unit of selection here as the cell, and the cell will acquire uh, new mutations upon cell division, uh, if that modifies uh, or, or confers a phenotypic advantage to that cell, then it might outgrow its neighbors and expand. And so, uh, so we can really leverage the concepts of uh, evolutionary theory to, um, to reconstruct or explain uh, our observations in cancer. And the key, real, key aspects of this is that acquisition of new mutations over time, um, especially in the context of, uh, of a therapeutic selective pressure, so um, uh, imposition of a drug, uh, mutations that are resistant to that drug or confer resistance to the drug um, will likely uh, confer a selective advantage on those populations. So for um, concepts like drug resistance, uh, evolutionary theory is, is, is critically important to, to understanding how drug resistance emerges. Um, and the bottom line is certainly that, as we discussed earlier this morning, is that tumors will be composed of heterogeneous clonal populations. And so to make sense of, um, of a sequencing of a bulk tumor, one cannot ignore this fact. And, um, and, and then in, in many cases, um, uh, considering the population structure helps interpret the biology of the sample under study. Yes? So in, in light of the, the two lectures you've given today about popping up very somatic mutations, simple somatic mutations, is there one type of genomic event which has a higher burden on the cell than the other one? Or um, so, so yeah, so, so we did... So we did discuss a little bit of that in the sense that um, it's it's probably um, too much for the cell to bear um, if two types of DNA repair mechanisms are uh, are deficient in the cell. So if mismatch repair is deficient, and as well as for example homologous recombination, which repairs double strand breaks, um, that's going to be a deleterious situation for the cell. Um, and in fact, I think um, drugs like PARP inhibitors exploit that. So, um, so, so certainly uh, defects in m multiple DNA repair pathways is selected against. Um, uh, and so the fitness of those cells is, is very low. So, um, so it's, it can be advantageous for the tumor to have one type of DNA repair um, uh, aberrated, um, but not multiple. Um, so the, the notion here that, that this evokes is that um, we might have a tumor that's composed of multiple populations that looks like this, maybe at time point one. And we can monitor, uh, if we could monitor these populations over time, uh, what we might see is uh, potentially through the um, imposition of an evolutionary bottleneck here that uh, with therapy, then what might emerge is a, a, a population that is really quite rare in, uh, in a primary case, but then becomes dominant um, over time. So the fabric of this tumor looks quite different um, from the starting point than, uh, than it did, did um, maybe at the end point. So, um, in particular, what we're interested in is, is phenotype. And so we talked about the concept of a driver uh, this morning. And, and another way to think about that is a driver mutation is a, is a mutation that alters phenotype. Selection, evolutionary selection operates on phenotypes, not genotypes. 
And so, um, so and given that, that uh, we may have differing genotypes, um, we can ask if they alter phenotypic behaviors, and more importantly, from a clinical perspective, is how this relates to treatment response progression and metastasis, um, as an example. So, uh, so this is now generally accepted in the field um, as, uh, as being uh, a major feature of cancers. Um, and uh, so, for example, um, in this review paper by Bert Vogelstein, um, one can have uh, several different types of, uh, of heterogeneity across a, a sample. So within a, a sample, one can, uh, a cancer can be comp composed of multiple clones. Um, those clones might have different metastatic potential or be selected for in different tumor microenvironments um, when they spread. Um, and, and of course, that it's also the, the same type of concept that leads to dramatic interpatient variability as well. So because each patient um, undergoes its own evolutionary trajectory, um, it's not terribly surprising that we don't see large overlaps in mutation content from one patient to another. There may be a few genes that are actually the phenotypic drivers, and the rest of the mutations um, uh, are maybe specific to that cancer um, or, uh, or, or just benign passengers. So, so these are concepts that we, we, we really must come to grips with. Um, work that's been carried out by, um, by Charlie Swanton and others uh, ha have revealed that um, SAMP evolution also happens in space, so anatomic space. So this is a, a project that um, undertook sequencing of metastatic lesions at the time of diagnosis um, and profiled what mutations were present in each of these samples. So this is one patient, multiple metastatic nodules, and each row here represents uh, one of these samples, and a column represents a mutation, and a gray box means that that mutation was present in that particular sample. So there, there's a block of mutations here that's shared amongst multiple samples, and this could be really viewed as the ancestral clone. So this is part of the initial clonal expansion that led to the tumor. But then you can see that there are many um, uh, sets of mutations here that are really specific to uh, specific samples. And, uh, and so this, um, these are necessarily probably mutations that um, are found later in evolution and, and maybe very specifically selected for, for the particular microenvironment of these tumors. So, um, so this is this is quite important concept to um, to think about um, when we're uh, sequencing a bulk tumor. One is how representative is that one sample of the entire um, mutation spectrum in the in the patient, uh, and then specifically if we find, um, for example, uh, a targetable feature in, in this sample, we uh, we can tell that that drug is very likely to be ineffective in the rest of the samples. So, um, so knowing the diversity and the distribution of mutations um, across uh, anatomic sites gives a rich biological information uh, and in some cases clinical um, application as well. Okay. So driver versus passenger, I think we've, we've um, covered that. and. Um, I think I said everything I need to say about that. Um, the, so then we can have um, the, the concept of temporal drivers is really quite important. So, so we can have driver mutations that initiate the neoplastic transformation. So classic examples of this would be P53 loss um, or KRAS uh, codon 12 mutation, for example, in pancreatic cancer. Um, and then uh, we can have driver mutations that confer metastatic potential. So, so these are not necessarily mutations that initiate the tumor, but maybe are acquired later um, and allow those cells to evade cell contact um, inhibition and uh, things like that, um, and then allow those cells to spread um, throughout the either vasculature or, or, um, or lymph system or it, it, other, other cavities within the body. Um, and, and certainly there are driver mutations that can confer chemotherapy resistance. So <clears throat> a classic example is, um, is uh, the T790M mutation in lung cancer in EGFR, 
um, where uh, patients that have been administered EGFR inhibitors um, often develop resistance through uh, mediated by acquisition of this new mutation, and that clone that carries that mutation expands out in the presence of anti-EGFR therapy. Um, and so that is a predictable driver mutation, um, but that's not present um, at a dominant levels in the initial tumor. Okay, good. So, you know, given that um, we can characterize a lot of biology from, uh, from inference and interpretation of mutations, um, there have been, uh, as you well know by this point, um, uh, massive efforts in cancer genome sequencing to improve cancer biology knowledge and identify targets for therapies. Um, and so th there's this classic um, paper that uh, was written by uh, Hannah Hannah Weinberg in, in, two cell, in, in published in Cell in 2000. There's been a, there was a 10 year anniversary version of this paper in, in 2010. Um, but what's interesting about this, so this, this paper, um, how many people have seen this diagram before? Should be, okay. Anyone interested in cancer biology should have seen it. Uh, but so it, de it de describes the characteristics that, um, that tumors share. Um, and, but what, one thing that it, it, it sort of leaves out is, is what is the underlying um, mechanism by which these features are acquired? And uh, sequencing the genomes of cancers um, can really reveal that. So certainly uh, we can ask what gen genetic abnormalities underpin the uh, ability of these tumor cells to achieve, achieve these phenotypes. Um, and then given the evolutionary context that I described is we can ask how do these genetic abnormalities change over time. And from a pathway perspective or a, a biological disruption pathway um, type of perspective, we can ask you know, what genes uh, or pathways um, would be altered due to uh, somatic genome aberrations. So, uh, you know, don't need to dwell on this to say that, uh, but major initiatives um, in the billions of dollars of investment are being put in to sequencing um, large-scale uh, sets of, of tumors. Um, the TCJ phase one is complete, um, and it probably contains about 5,000 cases, uh, if not more. Um, the ICGC initial phase is now um, three more years. Um, it's now underway and uh, has three more years, um, and uh, 25,000 cases are being proposed um, in the ICGC project, uh, and, and a lot of the informatics um, support is being um, headquartered here at the OICR. So, uh, so these are you know huge investments, and then that's just that's just the the major um, consortia that are involved, and, and then major centers uh, across the world now are investing in uh, both research study and clinical use of sequencing to inform uh, therapeutic options for patients. So, um, all told, it's not inconceivable that. Um, well over a million individuals will be sequenced, uh, their tumors will be sequenced in the next uh, few years. Um, so the, one of the results of the TCGA, um, and, and really I would stress that um, without doing unbiased analysis, some of these findings would have never been um, put forward. And so what this shows is a summary of the TCGA. and um, and. The columns here are the 12 major subtypes that were included in uh, what's called the pan-cancer analysis. And, uh, and then the rows are the genes, and the heat uh, encoded in this matrix shows you the prevalence of that particular mutation in that particular cancer type. So the, naturally, the, um, as you might expect, uh, here's P53, this, this row right here, you can see that this is the most the most frequently mutated gene across human cancers. It crosses tumor type um, and is, is really the kind of boss gene that we already we knew about this before. Um, but, uh, but nonetheless, uh, its distribution amongst uh, the major cancer subtypes maybe hadn't been co completely appreciated. Um, and then we see uh, subtype specific uh, alterations. So uh, uh, loss of von Hippel-Lindau, this VHL, uh, is specific to kidney cancer. Um, so, uh, so that's a disease that's defined by, um, by uh, von Hippel-Lindau. Um, and then we see uh, other 
oops, um, other mutations such as uh, here's APC in uh, in colorectal cancer. It's characterized uh, so colorectal cancer is characterized by I think it's on the order of 60% um, um, have APC mutation. Um, but some of the surprising findings were of the following. So, so I've just indicated here two um, biological themes that can be drawn out of the TCJ. And the first is that we see an enrichment for mutation and histone modification and epigenetic regulation. And this was previously underappreciated that as a mechanism for tumor genesis, epigenetic deregulation is now, um, is, is now well accepted that this is a major um, driving force for tumor genesis in the same way that DNA repair, for example, um, has been known uh, as a mechanism for, um, for tumor genesis. And then, and then even more surprising, perhaps, is, is, is that um, mutations in the splicing machinery, which you'd expect would have global impact or deleterious effects in the cell, um, have been shown in certain tumors um, to, uh, to, be, to be mutated more often than you'd expect by chance. And so I would stress again that, that these types of um, unbiased type surveys um, do yield uh, important discoveries. And so the only way to, to have achieved this type of result is to sequence the, the whole genomes of large numbers of cases. Uh, okay. So uh, some of the um, cancer genome sequencing work is, is directly applied in the clinic. Um, traditionally, there are uh, well-known uh, markers, for example, BCR able translocation in, in CML is a target of Gleevec. Um, then for diagnostics, uh, certainly, as I mentioned before, so high-grade serous ovarian cancer, um, 95 to 100% to estimates range of cases will have a, a loss of function P53 mutation. So if it doesn't have a P53 mutation, it's probably not high-grade serous ovarian cancer, it's something else. Um, companion diagnostics for targeted therapy, I'll, I'll, I'll expand a little bit on that, um, but, but for example, um, EGFR mutations for anti-EGFR um, TKIs in, in lung cancer, and um, certainly uh, BRAF V600E in melanoma. There's a, a nice website here that has some of the um, targets for personalized or targeted therapies um, for which inhibitors have been developed against mutations. And then I already mentioned the secondary mutations in uh, anti-EGFR uh, resistant tumors. Um, so these are markers of resistance to therapy. Uh, also, you know, KRAS codon 12 is a, is a, um, a resistance, and interestingly enough, is a resistance marker in um, colorectal cancers um, and so uh, that are treated with cetuximab. So, so these are um, mutations that can emerge uh, in the presence of therapy and, and, and often they're recurrent and predictable. Okay, so let's just now um, look in detail at the anatomy of somatic point mutations. Um, I think we, we can all uh, grasp this quite easily, but um, just so that we're all on the same page, um, we may have a sequence in the normal cell that looks something like this, um, and in the tumor cell, uh, we get a, a substitution, a G to T substitution in the tumor, um, and, uh, and that will uh, result in an amino acid change in the protein. Um, and so this results in, this is a real example of a P53 mutation um, that results in a loss of function or um, truncating uh, mutation in, in that uh, particular case. And so, um, so these are the types of things that we're, we're talking about. There are different classes of, of point mutations to know about. The first is a missense mutation, which is, can be defined as a single base substitution altering the amino acid sequence of a protein. So it, was a, it results in a, in a substitution, um, a protein substitution, amino acid substitution. There are silent mutations, uh, also called synonymous mutations, um, which are similar single base substitutions but do not change the amino acid sequence of the protein. Interestingly enough, there's a lot of work being uh, undertaken right now. Um, it, the, the general assumption is that these, these silent mutations are actually benign, they don't really have an impact, but, um, but there's a lot of it mounting evidence that um, a fair number of these mutations actually do impact by creating uh, cryptic splice sites or, um, or impacting regulation of, um, of transcription. Uh, 
you will often hear uh, nonsense mutations, or uh, that's synonymous with truncating mutations. And these are single base substitution in introducing a premature stop codon in the amino acid sequence. Um, and then, then we have um, frame shifting mutations, which um, are deletion, small deletions um, or insertions. These are single base or um, small numbers of bases that are inserted or deleted that change the reading frame uh, of the of the um, uh, of the open reading frame, and so that results in a premature stop codon and, and ha is a functional equivalent to, um, to truncating mutations. So often you'll see, um, when I say loss of function mutation, it's typically associated with a truncation uh, or a frame shift. Um, or it can be a copy number deletion, for example. That's, that's also another way um, to have a loss of function. Okay, so, um, so a classic uh, example of of a missense mutation uh, is is a is a mutation that um, that I was involved in, in discovering, which is uh, the missense mutation of, of FOXL2 in a, in a rare subtype of ovarian cancer. This is work I did with David Huntsman, and um, and so what we found is that uh, this is a, this is the quintessential uh, what's called a pathognomonic or or disease defining mutation. Every single case. Uh, has a somatic mutation at this location in, uh, in this FOXL2 gene. So uh, it now defines the disease um, and is being used as a diagnostic in, in different countries uh, and is a, is a clear um, separator of ambiguously, uh, uh, ambiguously diagnosed um, granulosa cell tumors um, sequencing for the mutation, which is very easy to spot because it's a single base um, we can de design assays to, um, to look for this specific allele uh, is now um, is, is the diagnostic definition for this disease. And so, uh, so this is really the, the quintessential um, hotspot type mutation. Um, other examples that are much more common are uh, examples like PI3 kinase. So, um, this is, uh, so PI3 kinase uh, as a pathway uh, is, a, is a commonly um, phosphoase, it, it drives phosphoase KT signaling is one of the most common um, aberrated pathways in cancer. And it's often driven by a mutation in one of two hotspots in the PI3 kinase protein. And so this is just a diagram that's, um, that's pulled out of the C-Bio portal. You may have seen, uh, are, they, are they looking at C-Bio portal, Michelle? Sure. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, so this is a nice website that essentially contains the TCGA data and other other data sets, and you can generate plots like this, which show essentially the prevalence of of a mutation um, distributed across a, a protein, um, and you can see that essentially the, the, the mutations in PI3 kinase cluster at these two regions, um, around in the first of all in the PI3 kinase domain, and then towards the terminal end of the protein here. Um, so these are. Um, these are uh, 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 well-known hotspots that um, where mutations accumulate, and so other well-known examples are um, KRAS codon 12 mutations in colorectal cancer and pancreatic cancers, uh, as well as BRAF V600E mutations in melanoma. We'll expand on those uh, in a minute. So if we look at um, these mutations uh, zoomed in. Um, this is this just shows you um, exactly uh, what what the reading frames are and, and how you can predict that. Um, here's the here's the actual base that's um, yeah this is the this is the amino acid sequence that's being changed right here, um, and and it can be hit <coughs> in any multiple ways um, through uh, substitution of any one of these um, these positions in the genome. And this is just shows how where the PI3 kinase gene fits into uh, phosphoase AKT signaling uh, in this um, keg pathway diagram. And so, uh, so it sits here and, and so can have a dramatic downstream effect on AKT, which drives signaling in, in a number of different directions. So, um, and, and so the, the mechanism of action here is that um, the, the phosphorylation capacity of PI3 kinase is changed by, uh, by the presence of those mutations. 
So these are hotspot mutations. Uh, they're characterized typically by missense mutations clustering in, in small regions of the protein. By way of contrast, um, tumor suppressor or loss of function mutations tend to distribute widely across the protein. So here's an example of um, uh, a study that was carried out in um, ovarian clear cell carcinomas and, um, and other uh, endometriosis-associated uh, ovarian carcinomas. And what we found is that approximately half the cases harbored mutations, loss of function mutations in a gene called ARID1A. ARID1A is involved in the sweet sniff complex, uh, which is involved in chromatin modification regulation. So it's one of these class of genes that's involved, involved in epigenetic regulation. Um, and in this disease is, is present in about, like I said, 50% um, has harbor mutations, and ARID1A actually is, is quite um, commonly mutated in other cancers as well. But the pattern here uh, is, um, is nicely depicted by, by showing the presence of these mutations is distributed almost e uniformly across the protein. And that's just to say that there are a number of different ways for which you can knock out a protein. Uh, in, the, in the other um, case where we're looking at PI3 kinase, um, there are only specific ways in which one can modulate activity of phosphorylation. And that's why the mutations cluster in those regions. Uh, so, so here's a summary of that um, from Vogelstein, um, showing, uh, again, PI3 kinase with, with mutations piling up in, uh, in the kinase domain and the helicase domain. And then um, another example, uh, which is the isocitrate dehydrogenase gene. This is another example of um, a very surprising finding by unbiased um, sequencing. So this is a, uh, a metabolic gene. And um, so metabolism, you know, gained fashion in the 1980s as a, as a way of um, uh, trying to understand cancers. But, um, but it wasn't until uh, then it kind of went out of favor in the era of discovering new oncogenes. Um, and then uh, with the advent of sequencing uh, being applied, uh, th these mutations were, were discovered in glioblastoma and also in AML. And, uh, and now, very quickly, so the first, first discoveries were made in, in the 2007-2008 era, and already there are clinical trials that, um, uh, that are testing inhibitors against this mutation. So that's a very rapid discovery um, cycle. And, uh, and so it, it, this is a, a, you know, a really interesting mutation that is characteristic of the hotspot oncogenic driver type mutations. Then to contrast that, here I've just put down two tumor suppressors, uh, two additional tumor suppressors, RB1 and, and, and von Hippel-Lindau, and you can see that how the mutations distribute across the protein, just like ARID1A. Okay, so, uh, so what good are mutations? Um, well, one, they help us understand biology, but um, two is they really identify targets for, um, for therapy. And there have been a number of um, uh, uh, regulatory body approved, so FDA, Health Canada, um, CE Mark, et cetera, um, drugs that have been approved to target these particular mutations. So I've just given some examples, and these are on-label indications, meaning that the drugs cannot be prescribed without knowing the presence or absence of the mutation. Okay, so, so it cannot be administered under the FDA or, the, or Health Canada on, uh, without those, those conditions being met. So uh, for metastatic melanoma um, that are BRAF, B600E positive, um, uh, one, can, uh, one can prescribe vimorafenib, which is a, a, an inhibitor now branded as Plexicon, I think, through, um, through some, I can't remember which company, but uh, since that's the commercial name for this inhibitor. And um, it's proven to be effective in uh, unresectable melanoma. Um, so EGFR XO19 deletions, or, or this particular uh, amino acid um, substitution, is an indicator for prescription of erlotinib in um, EGFR expressing locally advanced uh, non-small lung cancer. Um, and so this has shown to be effective, but um, naturally uh, when you uh, then this is the evolutionary process at play. Um, it selects for known resistance mutations. So um, the presence of a mutation in T790M um, is somehow inert to these um, uh, to these EGFR targeting uh, drugs, and so um, so that's uh, that, that's another example. And then um, for KRAS, uh, so this 
this in this particular case it's a contraindication. So uh, in EGFR expressing metastatic colorectal cancer, um, the mutation status of KRAS has to be wild type in order for patients to receive cetuximab. So because KRAS uh, uh, mutation is a resistance mechanism to cetuximab. So the on the label indication is that uh, these cases have to be KRAS wild type. Um, and so uh, that's, um, that's an, another example. So let's just look at um, how this can actually impact uh, clinical response. So uh, this is, the, this is the, um, the major paper that was um, published in New England Journal of Medicine in 2010, with Chapman et al., showing uh, a, a what's called a waterfall plot, which shows essentially the, um, the growth differential of tumors. Um, uh, and where each uh, line here in this plot represents a patient, and um, lines below the zero mark means that there was response, and um, lines above the um, zero mark means that there was growth on the drug. And you can see with the, um, with the BRAF inhibitor, most patients showed some degree of response, whereas uh, using standard chemotherapy, this is an alkylating agent, um, then mo a lot of uh, tumors um, didn't respond at all, um, and, and uh, much fewer cases exhibited a response. Yes? So you can predict, or you know, one would predict why the BRAF inhibitor worked, but what do, I mean, I think there's a lot of cancer types where we don't know why the general therapy works or doesn't work. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. So, so, and and so. I mean, you can, you can almost surmise that, okay, whatever, two thirds of the bottom graph, those people, we need to know why they don't respond to the standard therapy as well, not yeah. just like sure. targeted therapy that this, uh, you know, the tumor's going to outgrow in two months because it acquired resistance. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and actually, that's really the focus of. Um, a lot of the next phase of these large-scale studies is to um, uh, work with clinical trial samples um, where everything's controlled and we know the treatments are administered and we know the treatment arms and, and then we can compare the, the, um, the genomic characteristics of, uh, of patients that respond versus those that don't. Um, taking the, the samples as they are in, for example, TCJ or, or ICG, it's just kind of a mishmash of things. The treatment is not controlled, it, outcome data is not really available, um, and so, um, so the next phase of these studies is really directed towards that. And then, <coughs> excuse me, I think that a lot of, um, a lot of smaller labs are really doing these kind of more focused studies. So, so in my lab, for example, we're investigating the <coughs> Excuse me. Um, the di the differences in the genomes of um, of platinum refractory uh, high grade serious cancers versus those that have long term survivor survivorship, and and there are differences. Um, so so we can start to get at mechanisms of of, of um, why some cases are sensitive to, to platinum based therapies and sy systemic chemotherapy type drugs, um, and uh, it's. Uh, you know, the, the signals aren't obvious, like we don't see like a T790M mutation, but, but they're, they're there. Yeah. Do you think that's just because of the mechanism of these older therapies is so much more broad? Yeah, I think so. Um, so so that, the, the, the disappointing part about tar targeted therapies is that you know, they universally select for resistance. Um, so that's all we're doing is we're selecting for resistant clones. Um, and that's, uh, this is where um, new modalities like immunotherapy, for example, are really quite exciting because um, cause they, you know, they can actually contend with uh, the evolutionary capacity of, of cancers. Okay. Good. Uh, so, so then, um, so this is the this is the sad story here. Um, uh, so, just the presence of a mutation, of course, doesn't necessarily mean that uh, one can use that drug. And um, so, this is now uh, a lot of people are quite excited about the idea of off-label indications. So, so taking a, a, a drug that let's say was um, approved for melanoma, but um, and on the basis of a BRAF V600E and saying, well, ha, I have a colorectal cancer with a BRAF V600E, 
I should use that same therapy. Um, but unfortunately, what that ignores is that um, those are different cell contexts. And so um, colorectal cancers are expressing EGFR, and melanoma cells are not expressing EGFR. And so what happens is that you can administer um, uh, the BRAF inhibitor, and uh, then what you end up having is an EGFR expressing colorectal cancer. And so, um, and so what this paper shows uh, from, uh, from our friend uh, uh, Raji's department um, is that, um, that uh, uh, combination therapy of both EGFR inhibition and BRAF inhibition is necessary for response in colorectal cells of BRAF E600E. And um, looking at either uh, therapy alone um, results in um, no response. Okay, so cell context is important. All right, so moving beyond single genes, um, and so I've shown you really the the um, uh, the, the the really kingpins of of uh, of genes that we know about in. In cancer, but um, what I want to now focus on is the genome, and what can the genome tell us um, about uh, about different cancers, and how can they be used to stratify cases? And and so we can think about two concepts: is one is the mutation rate, so just the abundance of mutations in a given cancer, and the second is uh, uh, is mutational signatures. And mutational signatures um, are essentially a description of the distribution of the types of substitutions, nucleoti nucleotide substitutions that we observe in particular cancers. Uh, and what this um, paper showed uh, from the Broad is that um, different tumor types um, exhibit very different mutational signatures. And, and so this is this donut or bagel plot, as they called it, um, that shows um, along, uh, uh, as you go out from the center of the circle, the number of mutations per case, and each dot is a, is a particular tumor, and then uh, uh, arrayed around the circle are particular substitution types. And so, um, so here, uh, what's shown is there's a cluster of cases that have a predominance of C to A mutations, um, and, um, and these are characteristic of, uh, of lung cancers. And the interesting, so can anybody make a guess as to why that might be associated with, why are lung cancers, and on, really only lung cancers, associated with um, these, uh, these CDA mutations? Smoking. Yeah, so, so smoking induces um, the substitution uh, in DNA. Uh, and so uh, similarly, um, melanomas are characterized by a very large number of mutations. Uh, and they're characterized by C to T mutations, and not surprisingly, C to T mut mutation is the signature of UV damage to DNA. So melanomas are, um, have a high prevalence in, in places um, like Australia, where um, the ozone layer was unfortunately eroded, um, and protection against UV radiation um, was, uh, was reduced. And so, um, so this is a, uh, an example of um, of the types of signatures that, that one can, can actually use. So this is, in respect of gene content, we can learn a lot about what was potentially the underlying mutation mechanism that gave rise to these particular tumors. Um, so uh, let's see, what else can I say? And then, and then we might have cases, for example, AMLs, you can see here, um, they're characterized by very few mutations um, overall. And so um, this is a, a, a disease that is, it's a very aggressive cancer, um, acute myeloid uh, leukemia, and, uh, but it's characterized by very few mutations. And so it's, it's quite interesting from that perspective. Um, this is a, a different summary of, of similar data um, as summarized across uh, uh, in, in that um, TCJ pan cancer, um, showing that both the abundance of mutations um, across the different tumor types um, and the types of mutations uh, as depicted by these signatures is highly variable across um, different human cancers. And, uh, and so um, uh, this can be really be used to, to learn something about uh, what's going on in those cancers. Um, within even within particular cancers, um, the, the genomic properties of mutations are really um, 
important. So this is the uh, endometrial carcinoma or uterine carcinoma TCGA paper. Um, this, by the way, I think is my favorite TCGA paper. Um, a lot of them are kind of uh, a little bit intellectually vapid, if you will. Um, but this one is is fantastic. Um, I, I think this is a great paper um, and, and shows that um, there are uh, major subgroups of uh, endometrial cancer um, that are characterized in a number of different ways. So this is a group of ultra hypermutated cases. They have huge numbers of mutations. So this is a log scale here, and you can see that these cases have um, log orders uh, more mutations than, than the other subgroups. Um, and then their mutation signature, which is shown in the stack bar plot here, is very different than the rest of the than the rest of the cancers, and so um, so this hypermutation mechanism is actually um, uh, is is kind of hitting all kinds of substitutions, whereas the other cases have um, an enrichment for um, specific types of substitution. Uh, and then uh, if we look at uh, how to characterize, so these are uh, ultra mutated, and they typically don't have copy number alterations as we discussed earlier. Whereas this group over here they have a much lower number of mutations, but they have high incidence of copy number change. Um, so these are like the high-grade cancers um, that are uh, very much analogous to high-grade serous ovarian cancers. Um, and so you can see that there are just dramatic um, difference in genomic characterization, and uh, not surprisingly, uh, there are dramatic differences in outcomes here. So, um, so here you have um, the high-grade cases naturally, um, as you might expect, have much poorer outcome. And whereas these poly hypermutated cases, they almost all do extremely well. And, and, and so this has been validated um, several times over now, and it's true that these poly mutated cases that have um, ultra hypermutation uh, uh, really uh, is an indicator of a very good prognosis. Okay. Okay, so um, let's look at the statistical considerations, and, and we've really talked about this in the in context of copy number, but it's worth um, just going over them again. So we have tumor normal admixture problem. We have um, intratumoral heterogeneity or clonal diversity. We have uh, genomic instability. Um, and, and the experimental design uh, that's, that's really um, engineered for uh, capturing somatically acquired mutations that are present in the tumor and not the normal necessitates um, essentially doing two sequencing reactions. So you're going to sequence the normal and the tumor. And so that presents an opportunity for new analytic methods. And um, we, we'll go over some of these approaches. So, um, so the first step, as you've already um, gone over, is aligning uh, these millions of short reads to a reference genome. Uh, and when you do that, you might, look, you might end up with something like this. And um, so w once we align, then we can start looking at where the mismatches um, are and, and regions of um, or places where we have recurrent mismatches um, are good, good candidates for um, presence of mutations. And so the alignment process, there's a huge number of, uh, uh, of uh, methods, um, some of which are listed here, I've probably omitted some as well, but um, that's it. That's a well-oiled um, uh, uh, activity in the computational biology, uh, biology space now. So once we have alignments, then what we can do is, yes? Um, yes. Uh, you mentioned earlier that uh, from the sequence of data, you can, for example, not just look at the sequence, but determine copy number. And so from the same data set, you can run different downstream tools to get different data. But do you, um, is it typically normal to run through different aligners for these? Yeah. So um, that's, uh, that's definitely the case, um, in, in particular, um, for looking at uh, SNVs, what you really want to be careful about is um, making sure that indels uh, are accounted for when, um, when aligning. And, and a lot of the short read aligners don't, don't um, handle that very well. And so a lot of groups, what they do is they do what's called local realignment um, at, at indels. And that turns out to make a big difference in terms of um, accuracy of SMB calls, because um, if you don't align a gap to read 
correctly, it gives the false. And I'll show you an example of that. Is it gives a false positive, and so um, you know the the aligners that handle that uh, more accurately um, are better for SMV calling. But it may not make a difference. For example, if you're binning across uh, one KB regions, uh, you don't need to know. You, you don't just need to know that the read aligns there. You don't need to have the precise gap in the right place. So yeah, it does make a difference. Sure. Um, Okay, so uh, so this is um, now what what allelic uh, count data might look like. So here's an example of a of a normal genome. Here's the reference. Um, we align and um, we see that there are some regions that have uh, that have variants, and and we can just actually collapse this down into uh, two numeric vectors, which um, tell us the counts of um, the number of um, reads that match the reference and the number of, of total reads. And so, for example, here's a, here's a region, uh, here's a, a locus that has um, essentially matches the reference every time, and so um, we have six and six. Here's one that um, is actually uh, has a homozygous um, SNP, and so um, zero reads actually match the reference. Um, and, then, and then here you have um, what looks like a heterozygous SNP. Uh, where half the reads uh, match the reference. And when we're looking for uh, somatic mutations, this is essentially what we're doing, is uh, then we overlay the tumor, and we can see that that, that red locus that uh, we're in the normal had all the reads matching the reference. Um, that same locus in the tumor looks like it has um, some variants there. And so uh, half the reads in the tumor actually um, are showing this, uh, this substitution, which is A to C. And, and um, this locus uh, is, uh, is conserved in the tumor, so we see it is a homozygous SNP in the normal. It's also there in the tumor. Uh, but this one here, um, and, and this one here is a heterozygous SNP in the, in the normal, and it also looks like it's a heterozygous SNP in the tumor. So what we want to do here is isolate the red locus from the blue lo loci. Okay, so the red locus is the, what, the, are the things that we're, we're looking for. And we can do this with um, various types of statistical models. Um, uh, I won't go into the, to the details of this, but essentially there's a, a fairly good um, set of tools now that um, can, uh, can accurately pull out these red type of somatic mutations um, across a whole genome in a, in a reasonable computational time. So when we first started this work, I mean, this, it's worthwhile just going through the exercise that um, we really actually restricted ourselves to these allelic distributions and say, well, we can actually write down a very elegant statistical model that will distinguish all these different classes. And, and from a theoretical perspective, we can um, simulate data and we get perfect results. It's fantastic. We can have this nice model and, and, and it works really well. Um, in practice, unfortunately, um, the... the um, the realities of, of the sequencing technology um, render a lot of these predictions um, as false positives. So when we um, first started getting engaged in this work, um, we, we were looking at um, approximately uh, 3,000 mutations, and we revalidated these, we resequenced these to see if we could recover them again. Um, and um, interestingly enough, only a third of them turned out to be actually real. And, um, and so, uh, so we wanted to try to learn something from this. So we started digging into well, what was the reason for why um, these mutations uh, were were um, were not um, were not validated, uh, and and some of the artifacts that were due to, for example, misalignment. Um, these would be reads that would align equally well to some other place in the genome, um, and got misplaced at this particular locus. And so you can see here's a signal here. It looks like a mutation, but, um, but in fact um, it's just due to misalignment. In this one here, um, you have uh, we have a, a gap here um, that's uh, an indel, and what that is doing is that in in these particular reads here, the gap is not properly inserted, and so what that creates is a series of mismatches um, that are artifactual. In fact, the gap should um, should would would create a, a different position for these reads, um, and uh, and then. Uh, that signal, um, just by looking at this particular locus, um, uh, would would be rendered um, uh, back to what it should be, which is which is no no change here. Um, 
there is um, the base calling software of, uh, of Illumina machines um, uh, has some uncertainty associated with it. And so, um, so essentially um, what, what happens is that there's a, um, an image taken at each stage. I'm sure John went over this. <coughs> but, um, uh, and then, there, then there's a base call that's, um, that's made based on um, the color that's emitted from a particular cluster on the flow cell. And uh, that is a, a, is a noisy process. And so um, sometimes it's very certain what that call should be. And other times there's noise in that distribution. So there could be uh, multiple possible bases. And so you can calibrate um, the quality score of a, of a base. And in many cases, some of the false positives were due to um, just low base calls because the, the base call was actually incorrect. Um, so that's, those are sequencing errors. Um, in, in some cases, we saw examples where all mutations were sequenced only in one direction. And that's, um, that's a result of an optical PCR problem. Uh, that's well known. It's called strand bias. And, uh, and then some cases we saw um, uh, revalidation uh, work that just uh, it was kind of mystifying. So in this case, here you have very clean signals that couldn't be explained by things like base quality, it, presence of an indel, um, uh, strand bias, or anything like that, but it just doesn't validate. And so, um, so there's something interesting. Uh, whoops. Yeah, there's something quite interesting going on um, that uh, suggests uh, that you know here's here's a, what looks like a really good signal, but um, it turns out to be a false positive. So, um, so what is going on there? On the flip side, you have true positive examples that um, maybe have no business being true positive examples, but here, here's one that um, you know, has very few reads that support the, the mutation. Um, we called it, uh, and, and it turned out to be real. And so, um, so this is a due to probably a, a very minor population in the cancer that harbors these, these mutations. So maybe this has a, a cellular prevalence of somewhere around 10%. Um, and so we need to be sensitive to these these types of signals, yeah. How do you pick up those types of signals? Like, do you need to make your caller very liberal? Yeah. So, so there really is a as a trade off. There's always going to be a sensitivity specificity trade off. What you hope to do is capture things like this, while at the same time ignoring the noise in the in the system and not being subject to false positives. And so, I'll explain some of the, the, the ways that we can we can try to do that. Um, so. Uh, so here's another one that's you know very very rare. Um, uh, only two reads there show show the show the signal. Okay, so so given this set of yeah. Say that again. Oh well, yeah, that is what that's exactly what we're calculating the minor allele frequency. Yeah, or the variant. Um, it's, the, it's the counts of the variant. And so that count level really has to be above some, um, some statistical power to resolve it. Um, and, and so that's, uh, I'll show you some, some work that we've done to try to get to that. Um, so, so how can we leverage this information to, to um, be able to address these various comments? Um, well, we can take, um, there are a number of different measurements um, that uh, one can extract from, uh, from the data. And so at a given locus, one can compute many different um, quantitative metrics on a, a given locus. So these include things like map, mapping quality, base quality, um, the strand bias, um, uh, the actual number of, of, of mutant alleles versus, uh, versus wild type, um, et cetera, et cetera homopolymer runs, the presence of indels, um, many, many different features. So, so we undertook a study to see if we could learn something using leveraging machine learning techniques um, from the measurements that we had taken. This is work that uh, was led by Jari Ding in the lab. And so, uh, so what uh, Jari did is, is he took these 3,000 mutations, um, computed uh, 106 different features from each one of these mutations, um, some of which were jointly computed from the tumor and normal, uh, and then uh, tried to see if we could separate um, the real from, uh, from, from the wheat from the chaff, so to speak. 
And just a, a, a general exploration um, of this is a principal component analysis of, of the data suggests that when you project this onto three dimensions, in fact, the, the black points, which are um, which are the somatic mutations, actually can separate quite nicely from the germline and the wild type mutations. Um, and the germline and wild type um, can also be sub separated. So uh, so we, we we had some confidence that this would actually um, work, and so we used um, actually random forest based classifier to learn um, to learn a classifier that um, weighted the all the different features appropriately and to see if we could increase sensitivity and specificity and so uh, just looking at accuracy metrics um, uh, across um, uh, uh, in a cross validation study, uh, we could show that we really this is an AUC plot to show that we could dr dramatically improve um, the accuracy of calling uh, through this method that took into account all these different features uh, on top of the allele counts that I showed earlier. So allele counts are elegant in the sense that um, if everything's working correctly, then then we can really create nice models because they're really good probabilistic distributions that one can leverage for, for count data. But um, as it turns out, uh, the artifacts end up contributing more signal than, than we would like, and so they need to be modeled as well. And, uh, and so with this result, uh, we were actually able to characterize what are the major contributors to false positives. And, uh, and the first being um, strand bias was a major contributor. Um, there were, um, this is a known pattern uh, which is um, uh, cropped up is that uh, sequences involving GGT trinucleotides often get read as a GGG, and that's just a machine artifact. Um, uh, we had misalignments due to repetitive sequence, so repetitive sequence um, is a particularly nasty um, part feature of the genome that um, results in misalignments. Um, then we had another group of, of, of mutations with low base quality. Um, and then this, this one is really quite interesting in that um, this is the profile, if you will, of the, of the true somatic changes. And uh, this group of mutations here had, um, you know, all the similar characteristics of the somatic mutations, but in fact had um, just weak evidence of the variant in the normal. So this is a, a stochastic sampling error that, um, whereby, so whenever we sequence these fragments, it's like reaching into a bag, and there's a mixture of alleles. Uh, and you, you pull out and you get what you get, right? So we've all had a, a case where um, you know, you're playing uh, you're playing Yahtzee or something, and somebody gets a couple of Yahtzees in a row. Um, that's that's pretty um, unusual, um, but uh, but it can happen. And so um, so that's uh, essentially statistical tricks are being played there, um, and you just get unlucky and don't sample um, the the germline alleles uh, in the normal. And so that's what that group is all about. Okay, so uh, that's uh, uh, sort of an overview of some of the things that we need to consider um, from an analytical point of view when, uh, when detecting somatic mutations. And there are a number of tools now that are, are, are really robust and available and are used in, in very large scale like the TCJ or ICGC that um, work well and, uh, and, and so th these problems are largely a thing of the past. But I wanted to just draw your attention to them. These are important considerations. And I think you'll look in the lab at um, certain examples of, of wh wh when mutations that um, may be called are actually you know, probably not real. Um, and so you have, to, you have to pay attention to that. Um, so I'm going to skip over this. I'm going to skip over this. And I'm going to skip over that. OK. So, um, so some of the available tools for um, for SMVs. Um, one a really useful package is is SAM tools. Um, that's uh, a useful thing for um, uh, for extracting some of these features that, that I'm talking about. Um, there's a, a, a really good set of libraries, um, and um, have you, I'm sure you've, have you already used it. Yeah, they've already used it. Okay, so that's good. Um, the Broad Institute has um, this genome analysis toolkit called the GATK. Um, it, uh, it's, it's another um, reasonable framework for extracting these features uh, of, of mutations. I wouldn't recommend to use it for somatic mutation calling, um, but it has some, um, some, it's really designed for things like um, the Thousand Genomes Project, etc for normal human variation, or for clinical um, congenital abnormalities on, on normal DNA. Um, 
so some of the available tools for somatic mutation detection, um, probably the most popular tool is uh, called Mutec uh, out of the Broad Institute. And you can see that, uh, so it has a, a nice um, uh, uh, likelihood function uh, to compute um, the, the, the allele counts. And then essentially what they do is they push uh, their, their high quality or high probability mutations through a series of filters that um, account for uh, these various features that I've highlighted. Um, and, uh, and so um, uh, it's, it's kind of like a, a likelihood test followed by uh, filtration. Uh, and it claims to be sensitive down to a allele fraction of about 5%. So that was, uh, uh, you had a question about that. And so um, through those filters, um, then one can actually uh, start separating the signal from the noise. And, and that's always a function of, of coverage. So, uh, so the, the lower, the, the higher the sensitivity uh, one wants, or um, if we want to be sensitive to, let's say, 1%, um, uh, a 30x coverage obviously isn't going to cut. Isn't going to cut it, right? Because you'd be missing that allele mo more often than not. Um, but if you get up into a 500x or a 1,000x, then you can start being confident um, at a at a 1% allele frequency. Um, okay. Um, another very popular tool is called Strelka, and and this is actually um, from Illumina, and. Um, uh, and so it, it actually has something very similar in the sense that um, uh, it tries to filter reads and um, it has a feature though that's really quite important which is um, a realignment of uh, indel locations and uh, this makes the algorithm quite slow but, um, but in, certainly for indels uh, this is a, a really um, in our lab we use this uh, as in, in our production um, platform for calling indels. Uh, and then uh, our mutation caller is called MutationSeq, um, and uh, it has, it's a standalone Python package, and um, it actually has a, a visualization uh, component um, that's developed by Sidney Nielsen in the lab uh, that accompanies it. And so um, from a whole genome library, you can quickly um, uh, summarize, for example, uh, allele ratio distributions across the genome. Um, you can get a sense for where to maybe draw uh, a threshold for, for, um, for, for calling. So it's a probabilistic model that outputs a probability. And you can see here that there's a little inflection point in the, in the CDF. And somewhere around here is probably where the real mutations lie. So you can draw a threshold there, and, um, and, and, that, and that would be output the high quality mutation. Um, part of the visualization package is to um, plot the mutation signature um, automatically, and I think um, Fong's going to show you how to do that um, outside of this package um, in our markdown. And so, uh, so this is actually quite uh, convenient. And so, um, mutation sequence is the trinucleotide context um, of these signatures uh, as, as a native output. One of the things that uh, we've used it for, um, and this is a painful story for Hong, um, but is, is to do some QC analysis. So uh, it's well known that um, uh, oxidation of DNA during uh, sonication in the library construction process can induce, um, can induce substitutions, C to A substitutions. And so um, this is particularly problematic uh, be, because um, what happens is that these, um, these uh, mutations actually get written in the DNA. So they're real, uh, but they're artifact of the library construction process. And, uh, and so what we found in a couple of lymphomas that we've been working with uh, in, in Fong's uh, project is that we actually had a, a, a massive overabundance of C to A mutations that were essentially drowning out the signal. Um, and this is due to uh, this oxidative um, problem um, during sonication. So th th it's a sad tale, but, but at the same time, um, it shows that um, you, know, you can use these visualization tools to do some QC on the data. And, and, and I had recently had an um, experience with a collaboration um, outside of our center. Um, the collaborator sent us data that was, um, that was sequenced at their center. Um, and, and the agreement was that we'd do some analysis for them and, and, and do some interpretation um, on their project. And it was uh, a series of very precious samples um, that were very hard to collect. 
and um, and what we got back was data that looked like this, and so um, it was really a sad a sad tale. But um, it's much better than trying to um, than not knowing that this is the case and then over interpreting the data. So doing some QC steps on uh, on these distributions is really quite informative, and and what you can see here is that. Um, this uh, set of mutations um, corresponds very cleanly with very low prevalence alleles. So these are just um, uh, these are just uh, likely not uh, mutations that are that are real at all. And you can see there's another density cloud up here um, that are probably representing the real mutations. These ones down here are probably all just artifacts. So uh, so it's just a cautionary tale there. Um, the format for uh, for variant calling is um, VCF, and uh, this is kind of a, a what we would call a community standard. Um, it's definitely not a technical standard, uh, but is sort of widely adopted. Unfortunately, it has a very flexible format, so uh, so you can't really call it a standard at all. Uh, but nonetheless, it's what people use, and um, uh, you know it's computer scientists in the room shudder. Uh, at this, but but this is what's what's used in the community, and you should get used to um, to knowing what VCF is. So it has two components. Um, it has a header, um, which uh, which shows um, uh, essentially some metadata about uh, what's gone into creating the output, and you can see um, uh, there's this info um, this info tag tells you uh, essentially what um, what fields are are located in that uh, info tag, and so so here for mutation seek um, we have probability, which is PR, and and then there's a, a little description that says, okay, this is a probability of somatic mutation. Um, then we have another field called TR, and uh, and it and it's a whoops, and it's a number, and it tells you the count um, uh, of tumor. Uh, reads with the reference um, reference allele, and uh, similarly for normal, and then you have the trinucleotide context, uh, and so uh, this this is the metadata at the at the head of the file, and then you get into the real data. It looks something like this, so it has a chromosome, um, it has a position on the chromosome. Um, it can have you can have a, an ID, and sometimes this is the um, the RS ID of a SNP. Um, that that's really what this ID is for. Uh, of course, for somatic mutations, um, we hope that they don't have RSIDs uh, in dbSNP. Um, and then, uh, and then you have uh, uh, the, the the reference base, the alternate base. You have a quality score. Um, you can have a, a filter which says, does it pass this given filter? Um, and then you have this info field. And so, the info field is. Um, uh, actually, a, a, a semicolon delimited um, set of fields um, that uh, correspond to those tags in the info of the header. So here's the probability um, of that being a somatic mutation, and you can see here that that's a very low probability. Um, and then, then the counts here are given. So this is a tumor reference, a tumor alternate, normal reference, normal alternate. This trinucleotide context. Uh, and then the number of indels is actually um, in the surrounding vicinity is also given. Um, okay, so I think you're going to explore VCF in the lab, and so you know you should get used to looking at these types of files. Um, they're quite useful, and 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 the, the, in some ways they're nice because they're text files. You can actually grep through them. You can use Unix to um, pull out just specific rows, etc., like that. Um, or you can use um, you can get fancy and use tools like sed and awk. To filter these files for, um, for you know, let's say you want to find all mutations um, with a given probability or higher, um, so you can use uh, Unix tools to to pull those out. And there are also um, some tools that um, um, have been developed specifically for um, manipulating and working with VCF. Um, I think there's a package called VCF Tools um, that is quite popular. You can use that. The other uh, attractive thing about VCF is a number of the downstream annotation tools that you'll learn about tomorrow um, uh, actually input VCF. So, so for example, like this is this is quite um, useless information if you don't know the gene content of the mutations. For example, right? This is just pulling out coordinates of the genome and saying there's a mutation at this position. But of course, we all want to know uh, what gene is there, what amino acid substitution is, is, is corresponds to that gene, and so you can use tools like SNPF.
or N of R, or things like that, that can um, take in these files and output um, annotated files. So here's just a list of some tools uh, and their associated websites. Um, and, uh, and then there are a number of visualization tools you're already familiar with IGB, um, and, uh, and that's um, an exercise that you're going to do in, in the lab this afternoon. Uh, and then here are this uh, series of uh, annotation tools. Um, there's Mutation Assessor, there's Anovar, uh, and SNPF are three uh, nice annotation tools that, um, that are out there in the community that people use and, and have been used in, in major publications. Uh, and I think I won't say more about that because you're going to learn about that in detail tomorrow. Right? Okay, good. So um, any questions at this point? That's a little dry, I know, but now we're getting to the good stuff. <laughs> there are a lot of databases and tumor repositories where we don't have normal controls. Is it not worth anyone's time to try and do variant calling on DNA seq or RNA seq samples for which there's no normal control? So uh, I think if you cast it, you think about it from um, from a signal to noise ratio perspective. So the the germline polymorphism rate. Um, is somewhere in the range of, uh, of 1 in 10,000 in any given individual. Right? And that results in, on the, on the order of 2 to 3 million SNPs um, in any one individual's genome. So you and I would differ at 2 to 3 million different positions. Okay? So uh, between a, a tumor and its match normal, the mutation rate is somewhere in the order of, of 1 in a million. And so in any given tumor normal comparison, you may end up with s around three to 10,000 mutations. So the problem with um, doing variant detection in only the tumor samples, of course, those germline polymorphisms will be there as well. And, and so you're looking at a, at least a 10 to 1 um, signal in the germline that's going to squash the, the, um, the somatic signal. So what about filtering? or known um, yeah. mutations in cancer genes using the cosmic database. Program. Right, okay. So, so in that case, um, it's, it would be useless to sequence the whole genome. So what you should do in that case, and this is what's typically done, is you can design a panel. Let's say you're just looking at um, on-label drug indications. You want to find KRAS codon 12, BRAF V600E, um, PI3 kinase hotspots, etc. Um, so then you design a panel that looks only at those locations because you know that if those mutations are in, a, in, a, in the germline, that's, a, that's embryonic lethal. Those, those, those embryos will never develop. Um, so, uh, and so those are unambiguous changes, and, but it would be a complete waste of money to, to sequence the whole genome when you can do a panel for 200 bucks. Mm -hmm. So does uh, these steps are incorporated in variant calling pipeline? Well, uh, that's a good question. So, so the question is, is you know, what QC steps do you take? Um, in variant calling, it's, it's subtly different um, because uh, the, the resolution is very it's single nucleotide. And so the, the patterns that you can extract in copy number colony, because you're looking at maybe 1KB windows, there actually are correlations to um, pattern of GC content, for example, that one can normalize out. The single nucleotide level, the best you can do is, for example, remove um, optical PCR duplicates, for example. That's, that's a really important step. Um, and so there are tools uh, for pre-processing that um, are part of the Picard package. And um, Michelle, have you done any pre-processing? Have you guys done any pre-processing work on, on BAMs? So using RM dupe or Picard tools or anything like that to cover that? No, okay. Yeah, that... Okay. Yeah, maybe that's something um, to consider for next time. But but essentially, um, you know, there are there are well known steps that you can take, um, and and um, I think the Broad has a best practices um, workflow to go through. And essentially, what um, what it involves is is doing alignment, um, local realignment for the indels. Uh, removing optical PCR duplicates, and then uh, essentially, then uh, you can do um, then it forks, and then. Maybe because of the, the 
high GC content, the read depth at that region would be lower. Yeah. So calling a heterozygous SNP would be would be difficult because sh sure. Internet a bit yeah, less, but but there's you can't it's it's very you can't add more content there, right? I mean, so. No, but uh, if you can normalize your variant calling function so that uh, three in a read depth region of ten would be considered sufficient to call a heterozygous SNP, but in a read depth of forty. Work. Yeah, and that's where the probabilistic models come into play. So, so, um, so one can leverage the binomial distribution, for example. It, it exactly takes that into account, right? So, um, and and so the binomial distribution is like coin flipping, and uh, and you try to understand. Uh, so, the more times you flip a coin, um, the more confident you can be in in whether the coin is biased or not. So let's say that you're trying to find but find out whether the coin has has a skew towards heads or tails. You need to flip it a large number of times in order to establish that. So if you only have three flips, you probably won't be able to establish that. Right? And so this, so so then the, the probability density function of the binomial, when there are few observations, is always low, um, and it gets it gets higher with more confidence. So so that that accounting for variance in depth. Is um, is encoded in the probabilistic models of um, of the binomial distribution and also in, in mutec, uh, which is the log odds distribution that, that is, is published there in the um, in the slides. Trimming? Yeah. Yeah. So um, so good question. So certainly for um, for panels or for PCR based um, amplicon. Work um, trimming of the data becomes important because often you read into the um, you read into the, either the primer or you read into adapters, and um, and then also sometimes the quality of reads um, the quality of the base calling will tail off towards the end of the reads, and so a lot of people do do some trimming of reads um, that, uh, that that remove the those low quality regions of reads. Yeah, it's a good point. And I think there are a number of tools now um, out there that can um, work with FASTQ data to uh, to do quality control and um, and and, and pre-processing the data even prior to alignment. So. Yes. Uh, do you have recommendations on whether to do the before alignment or after? So I've usually been doing trimming before I align just because it's sort of a lot of reads and so before Yeah. Um, I don't have hard data on that to see what, you know what what results in a better practice, but intuitively it would make sense to um, trim before. Yeah. Okay, good, good questions. Um, so in the last part, then um, we'll we'll return to this idea of um, uh, of trying to do some advanced uh, work in in clonal evolution uh, with uh, working with mutations this time. So, so it's um, you know it's well established that cost-effective uh, interrogation of the whole genome of cancer is now there. Um, that's really the the, the biggest um, uh, sort of marketing or, or selling point of, of this technology. Uh, but perhaps what's less well appreciated is is the digital nature of the technology, and what that allows for is a very precise estimates of allelic prevalence, if you remember back to the uh, definition from this morning. Uh, and so through uh, either capture or through PCR, one can actually measure very deeply at a particular locus to get precise uh, allelic abundance uh, measurements. So in our pool of DNA, we might have um, uh, uh, fragments like this, and, and some small proportion, maybe 10% of the alleles, uh, contain a particular mutation. Um, and so when we sequence very deeply, then uh, that proportion is reflected in uh, the reads that uh, are output from our sequencing reaction. And so what we see here is that um, it, you know, some, some small proportion of the data actually uh, harbors that particular mutation. We can count that very precisely. So again, it's a, it's a, it's a, a switch. The so Sanger sequencing is the, is the analog way of doing things, and this is a digital representation of the mixture. And that is very powerful because it allows us to, to start um, uh, thinking about how we can deconvolute mixtures of, uh, uh, of, of different clonal populations in bulk sequencing, um, etc. And so, uh, so this has been leveraged uh, in, in a number of different um, experimental designs. 
Um, and, uh, and so we can um, try to, from a, a single bulk sequence, um, of course we don't know what the composition of that bulk sequence is, but we can try to infer that from the allelic prevalence measurements that we're taking uh, across different mutations. Uh, and this has been shown in a couple of papers, um, namely uh, uh, an exploration of triple negative breast cancers um, that was published a couple of years ago. Um, and, and then we can uh, think about how those allelic uh, measurements change over time or in space to get some idea of whether um, selection is operating or whether clonal expansions are happening over time. And so I, I gave that example of how uh, a tumor, uh, the, the composition of a tumor in terms of its clonal composition can really change um, for, over time uh, in the presence of a, of a therapeutic intervention and, and also across spatial samples. This, this is um, it depicted here uh, is an ovarian cancer but with um, multi um, intraepithelial um, metastases and, and also lymph node um, metastases as well. And so we can compare the relative abundance of, uh, of specific alleles across these different uh, spaces. And then, um, and, and then the field is moving rapidly into single nucleus sequencing uh, and, uh, and we, we've, been, um, we've been doing a lot of that activity as well and I'll, I'll explain a little bit uh, of our progress in that front. So. So this is, uh, uh, this is a nice sort of schematic of what we're, of what we're actually doing here. Um, we're sequencing a mixed population, uh, and, and, and then we get digital representation of those alleles. So at a given position, we might have, let's say, two reads here that uh, harbor this particular red mutation. Um, and it's proportional to the mixture uh, that's in our, in our bulk. Uh, population. And so just to reiterate, we have these two concepts of definition, allelic prevalence and cellular prevalence. And so allelic prevalence is proportion of reads with the variant, and cellular prevalence is the proportion of cells with the variant. And it's very, it's very important to note that these two things are not equivalent. And, uh, and the reason is, is because um, of uh, uh, the concept of genotype. And similarly to, uh, to what I showed in uh, the copy number space, um, the mutations can have mutation genotype as well. And, uh, and so that, uh, that results in a, a, a problem where one has to sort of deconvolute the prevalence of the mutation uh, and its genotype at the same time. And so we've developed some models uh, around that, um, namely uh, a, a method called PyClone, which is developed by Andy Roth in the lab. And, and what PyClone can do is actually um, then cluster mutations according to their cellular prevalence. And, uh, and so this is just a, a, an example of a, of a systematically designed experiment. We took two uh, cell line populations. Um, we we uh, examined a panel of mutations that um, fell into three different classes. We had mutations that were shared in both cell lines and then mutations that were specific to one and mutations that were specific to the other. And then what we did is we mixed those cells at known proportions to see if we could recover the cellular prevalence of those mutations uh, over time. Uh, or not over time, but o over that series. And essentially what that simulates is that if you order that prevalence um, of the mixtures, uh, it simulates the idea that there's a, a clonal expansion happening over time. Um, and so as the prevalence of, uh, in the mixture of, of one sample goes up, that simulates a clonal expansion and that comes at the expense of the other one. Uh, and so um, what's, what's nice about this uh, idea is that um, uh, we know exactly what the expected distribution should look like, and that's what's shown here. So these are the sets of mutations that are specific to, uh, we'll call it the red cell line. And then we have these blue ones, which are sets of mutations that are specific to the blue cell line. And then the green mutations are mutations that are shared in both. And so, of course, the mutations that are shared in both are going to be, um, are going to be at 100% in, in, all, in all the experiments. And I'm showing here schematically time, but in fact, these are actually mixing proportions um, on the x-axis. And, and, and so with our, our statistical model pi clone, what we're able to do is actually um, the, the dotted line is the ground truth. And then the overlaid line is, uh, is the inferred prevalence. And you can see that the model is doing uh, very, very well. And the, uh, the nice thing about this is that um, 
it, it really simulates this idea of an expansion and um, and, and an extinction clone. So, so this is this would be simulating a clone that's expanding. This would be simulating a clone that's um, ex that's being extinguished. And the the important thing to note here is that when you have lines that cross like this, when you have uh, sets of mutations that are um, that are decreasing in prevalence and sets of mutations that are increasing in prevalence, those by definition they can't be in the same cells. So those really mark clones that um, are distinct from each other. Those are mutually exclusive mutations. And, and so I'll show you how that comes into play in a, in a real study in a minute. Can you for this? How long is uh, so this isn't really time. This is actually just mixing proportions. Uh, okay. it, right? so, so, but it's a simulation of time. There are no other mutations that arise? Correct, correct. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah. Um, so so uh, we engaged, uh, again, this is work with Sam Aparicio, um, in, uh, in trying to understand um, population dynamics of cells uh, using temporal sampling. And, uh, and this, so this is now looking at um, time series and trying to imagine these, uh, examine these populations as they're changing over time. And so, um, so Sam had been generating uh, breast cancer um, patient-derived xenografts. And what these are are um, the materials extracted from patients uh, tumor materials extracted from patients and then uh, implanted into immunodeficient mice uh, and allowed to grow. And so, uh, again, thinking from an evolutionary perspective, um, in the patient, you have the microenvironment, you have the, the immune system that's keeping uh, the two, that has some pressure on the on the on the cancer, um, and then we're taking that tumor out of that selective pressure and putting it into a mouse that doesn't have an immune system and is also a, a, new, a new host. So you can imagine that selective pressures are quite different. So one might predict, even though these models are actually used uh, for a lot of um, uh, drug efficacy type programs, um, uh, you can imagine that uh, there might be uh, quite a dramatic change in, in, in selective pressure when you take that to patient tumor and, and put it into a mouse. So we want to investigate the degree to which this happens. And so, uh, so what we did is we, um, uh, we, we took a series of 15 um, PDXs and uh, we compared the clonal composition of the tumor to, uh, to serial passages of the xenografts and, uh, and tracked these mutations, the, the cellular prevalence of these mutations over time um, and to see if, uh, if there were changes. And in almost every case, we saw some degree of, uh, of dynamics uh, in clones. And so the, one extreme example is this one here where um, the first time point is the tumor um, and, uh, and then we have the xenografts uh, shown in red and you can see that um, there's a dramatic expansion of a very minor clone that's present in the, in the tumor expands to be almost dominant in the xenograft and that comes the expense of the dominant clone that was in the tumor uh, essentially shrinks to nothing. Um, and so there's, this is a really uh, dramatic case where um, on engraftment, there is a massive amount of, uh, uh, of evolutionary dynamics happening. Um, and then we could ask, you know, does that stabilize over time? And in this case, it looks like it's, it's fairly stable, although there's an emergence of, of a clone here in passage X4. Uh, but the most extreme example of, of ongoing dynamics after engraftment was, was this case here. Uh, and you can see that um, uh, there's really a dramatic expansion, I think I've got a zoomed version of this, um, of this green clone uh, over time um, that was essentially very, very rare in the tumor, uh, but then uh, came to dominate the, the xenograft after five, um, after five serial passages. And again, this comes at the expense of other clones that um, that, uh, that that actually are extinguished. So, so you can see that this looks somewhat rep reminiscent of our systematic experiment um, where we did the mixtures. And um, oh, you can't see. Okay, there we go. Uh, something's funky, funky with my animations, I think. But um, anyways, uh, so so this. Um, this expansion of this green clone uh, comes at the expense of this red clone here. Yes? Are there other genetic changes that are continuing as its passage? Yeah. That's right. So, so in fact, um, uh, these, these cases that are underlined are the cases that we actually did whole genome sequencing on. So we didn't just look at mutations that were present in the tumor. We looked at mutations that were specific to the xenograft as well. And, and they are indeed um, new mutations arising, um, or they become detectable um, as we go. And so, uh, 
so the, the, the mutations in the green cluster are a perfect example of that. So um, these are, the, the, we just sample these, but there are 15 mutations that um, are characteristic of mutations that are essentially um, new in the, in the X5 passage. Uh, so, so it's difficult to know, uh, to interpret their um, selective capacity. So I should mention that th this, this study is all done um, without any kind of drug intervention. So that's the next phase of the project is now to do systematic drug intervention on these xenografts um, to, to determine whether there are common um, features that are selected out uh, after putting um, these populations through a, through a bottleneck like that. Um, so, but that we just wanted to establish a baseline. And the dynamics were enough to, um, to, to, to think about, um, first of all, developing methodology to track clones. Um, that that in, in and of itself is a, is a major contribution because now we can actually systematically look at um, population dynamics in, in time series in patients um, by, by using this type of method. So patients that have local relapses or serial relapses, for example, there aren't that many that we can get, but we, we do have some. And, and so we can start asking these questions that um, on therapy, what clones emerge um, relative to the primary tumor. Okay, so, <laughs> okay, I'm getting the evil eye. Um, I, I'm only I'm right at time, so I'm going to spend two more minutes here. Uh, so, uh, so, so the remarkable thing about this study is that these dynamics were actually reproducible. So we actually um, created biological replicates of these xenografts, uh, and and the same clones emerged um, uh, repeated times. So there is something deterministic about um, about the genotypes of these clones, um, which suggests that they um, they they really do have uh, some fitness advantage over their neighbors. Um, so, so the last thing I wanted to discuss is, you know, so okay, so this is a xenograph system. How relevant is it to patients? How relevant? How relevant is this concept to patients? Um, well, there really is an emergence of uh, of, a, of a really exciting field uh, in self recirculating tumor DNA. Um, you may have uh, heard about this, but essentially, um, these techniques uh, of of measuring allelic uh, prevalence um, can be leveraged. Um, by measuring these, these mutations in blood um, or in plasma. And so, uh, so tumors uh, do apoptose they, they sh and they shed their DNA and, and often that DNA can be picked up in the circulation. And, and so um, the idea of, of tracking a mutation um, in blood is, is quite um, attractive because it's a non-invasive liquid biopsy uh, for patients. And so um, there's a huge field now that's being um, uh, that's growing uh, that uh, is is engaged in this idea of targeting particular mutations um, and looking at their abundance in plasma as a measure of of tumor burden. And so here you can see, for example, this is monitoring of a of a KRAS mutation, um, and uh, over time uh, a patient's um, plasma was examined, and the allele fraction of that particular mutation was measured, and 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 basically one can see here that um, it starts to go up, and this is really an indicator of of, of increased tumor burden. So this patient is relapsing, um, and it can be predicted um, from from the plasma. And uh, in a different paper, um, uh, this group showed that, uh, in fact, one, it can be used to really dissociate different clones. And so here, this is a breast cancer patient with a p53 mutation. Um, and uh, what's very interesting is that um, one can measure, uh, it has a p33 mutation and a pi3 kinase mutation. And on, uh, on paclitaxel, which is uh, an inhibitor of PI3 kinase, uh, you can see that that clone that harbors PI3 kinase, um, the abundance of that clone drops almost to zero. Unfortunately, it comes back again, but for that period of time while on treatment, um, uh, the, uh, the, the PI3 kinase clone um, essentially is, um, is extinguished. And, and so this is, uh, again, this is not using tumor tissue. This is using uh, plasma from blood samples. Yeah. Um, so, so, so that's that's a good question. I don't have a good answer for you. I think there's there there are very um, rigorous SOPs that are um, established, and I think one of the things that's really important is to spin down the plasma um, uh, within something like an hour because the half life is um, of that DNA is is pretty short, and so um, so that's there's some 
pretty um, stringent SOPs that need to be followed in order to extract the signal out. It doesn't uniformly work in some cases where it just doesn't work at all. So, um, so it's highly variable in efficacy. Yeah. You actually get a lot of, I mean, yeah. most of the DNA in a lot is in the animal. Yeah. <laughs> it's not perfectly isolated, that's for sure. There are some um, platforms that um, enrich for the mutant alleles, and so that's the so so then you don't you don't get um, uh, accurate counts, relative counts, but you get absolute counts um, in terms of um, because the the targets are enriched and then the rest is thrown away. And so, um, it's a boreal genomics, for example, is a, is a, is a platform that uses that technology. Um, okay, so I think uh, with that, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll close. And, and, but just, I, I wanted to read this um, concluding thought because I think it's quite relevant to all the things that we've been talking about. And this is from that seminal science paper um, from Peter Knoll in 76. Uh, he says, the acquired genetic instability and associated selection process most readily recognized cytogenetically um, results in advanced human malignancies being highly individual, karyotypically and biologically. And hence, each patient's cancer may require individual specific therapy, and even this may be thwarted by emergence of genetically uh, variant sublines resistant to treatment. And then more research should be directed towards understanding and controlling the evolutionary process in tumors before it reaches a late stage usually seen in clinical cancer. Uh, so, so this is really quite a prescient statement because, um, you know, back then we didn't have the measurement technologies that we have now. And, and, and what, what's very clear is that by measuring um, these mutations and, and putting, casting them in an evolutionary context, uh, it, it's incredibly illuminating as to uh, what, what are exactly are the dynamics of cancer. And it's clear that um, uh, concepts like population genetics um, and trying to keep evolution in check uh, is going to be uh, a dominant um, area of research uh, going forward. And this is why, as I said before, um, methods like uh, immunotherapy uh, are really quite attractive because essentially leveraging the body's own immune system um, to 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 um, uh, battle the arms race between uh, acquisition of new mutations and, and keeping um, immune surveillance in check. Of course, that also has its side effects. You don't want to over stimulate the immune system because we all know what, um, the problems with uh, uh, autoimmunity, etc. But but there are some very promising um, combination drug therapy, for example, is another approach that one could could use to try to keep evolution in check. And so um, I think this is a very exciting area of research and, um, and, and really is, um, is probably key uh, to, uh, to eliminating progression uh, in, in cancer over time. So, uh, so with that, I, I should acknowledge a large number of people, um, a couple of which are actually in the room here, Fong and, and Andrew and um, other grad students in, in my lab, um, are constantly educating me, um, and it's, it's a great privilege to, to work with people like that. Um, and so, uh, in particular, I acknowledge uh, Sam Aparicio and David Huntsman, who are my close colleagues, and um, uh, a lot of uh, the ideas that I presented today um, are a result of lots of conversations um, with, with the two of them. Um, and so, uh, and my work is funded by a large number of organizations as well. So, um, I think I'll stop there, and uh, thank you for your attention, and hope you enjoy the rest of the workshop.